OK, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Chris, G4 AUF, chairman of the Radio Society of Harrow, and uh, this is our very first online meeting. So I hope that uh, you're going to enjoy it. It's going to be a talk by uh, Rob Heaton, uh, G3UXG, on an introduction to digital radio. And um, if you want to ask questions, uh, ask them in the chat, the live chat. Uh, and also, if you want to email them, you can email, email them to uh, webmaster at g3efx.org.uk. And then uh, at the end of the talk, uh, Kirk, uh, our webmaster, will uh, pose the questions to Rob. So that's how, uh, that's how it'll work. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. And um, we'll tell you about some other things coming up at the end of the talk. So over to you, Rob, and uh, on with your talk. Right. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. Um, I haven't been down to Harrow Radio Society for some time because of the coronavirus and so on. So by way of introduction, I was licensed in 1965. Seems an awful long time ago. And I got interested in radio because one of my uh, colleagues at school built a little radio which doesn't need a battery, i.e. a crystal set. So I've been involved with it ever since. Um, so recently, many new modes have been developed for shortwave radios uh, enthusiasts, which run on a computer. So I thought it would be interesting to have an overview of what's going on in the background uh, colleagues at school, so that you can uh, design your own system. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to show you how easy it is uh, to implement this. Um, I think somebody will have to mute their microphone because <laughs> we've got somebody in the background. Enthusiasts, which run on a computer. So I thought it would be interesting to have an overview of what's going on in the background uh, colleagues at school so that you can uh, design your own system. So the aim of this talk is, is to look at digital transmission and reception from a practical point of view and show you how you can experiment to make discoveries. So amateur radio enthusiasts have been involved in experimenting with science and electronics for as long as anybody can remember. And by working together, particularly nowadays with the advent of the Internet, uh, it's surprising what you can achieve. And there are many different ways you can experiment using simple and readily available parts. So as I was saying earlier, just in recent years, many new um, types of digital transmission have come into existence. In the old days, we had radio teleprinter, RTTY, uh, Morse code CW, phase shift king, and AMTOR. Uh, but more recently, we've got the new digital modes, FT4, FT8, JT65, MSK144, etc. Uh, and just recently in December, a new one's come out called Q65. So that's at the end of last year. And we can communicate via satellite now, geostationary satellite, using the QO100 uh, system. So what we'll do is look at the basics behind some of these modes, look at some practical circuits, and see how they can be implemented or modelled. So digital transmission generally, what, what are the benefits of it? Well, one of the benefits is, is that you get good audio signal to noise ratio, even with weak signals and interference. Uh, another advantage is that data and voice can be tr transmitted at the same time. So you can send your location or other information which might be useful to the person at the other end. Um, all these amateur digital modes use codecs. That means a coder decoder. Uh, which allows you to get good quality signal in a narrow bandwidth. But like single sideband, there is some distortion in the background. There are three very popular modes, DMR, D-Star and Fusion, and all of them use FSK type modulation. One of the advantages of digital systems is that they can be regenerated at repeaters. Um, and for the digital modes, you have to use dedicated repeaters, but they'll connect you to other repeaters all around the world. So you can talk to people in other countries quite simply. Uh, the problem is that the different modes, DMR, D-Star and Fusion, 
are not compatible with one another. So you can't talk to another radio using a different um, format. Uh, and of course, in recent years, data modes such as FT8 and WSPR have come into being and it allows you to see your signal on the internet. So you can tune in um, to a software radio on the internet and see how far your signal is getting out. Well, look at some of the basics then. To make our signals travel as far as possible, we need to make them as different as possible from all other signals and noise. And narrow bandwidth signals allow the receiver to reject noise and interference. And I think FT8 has a bandwidth of about uh, 60 hertz, so it's a very narrow bandwidth signal. Now, the way we can make our signals narrow bandwidth is by compressing the input signal, which is called source coding, compressing the transmit signal called channel coding, or just by using filters, of course. Now, this is a block diagram of uh, transmitter and receivers for um, digital transmission and reception. So if you look at the slide, the audio, video, or data that you want to transmit, whatever you're sending comes in on the right-hand side here. It goes into an analog to digital converter, which converts the analog signal into binary numbers. These are then processed by a processor, which could be um, TTL logic, a gate array, or a microprocessor like a Raspberry Pi. And then the signal goes to a digital to analog converter, which converts the digital signal into analog form again so that we can amplify it in a power amplifier and possibly pass it through a low pass filter before it goes to the aerial. And of course, on the receiver, you've got the, um, the reverse of all that. The weak digital signal comes in, goes through a low noise amplifier, uh, probably a band pass filter, and then an analog to digital converter, which converts the very weak signal into binary bits and then into a processor. And finally, after the signal has been demodulated, it's fed to a digital to analog converter. So we get the voice, video or data that we wanted to receive. So this is a little bit about um, analog to digital conversion. Um, the number of binary bits that the ADC produces determines how accurate a representation of the signal is obtained. So it affects what's called the dynamic range, i.e. the weakest signal you can uh, represent by a binary number and the strongest signal that it's possible to process. And the diagrams at the bottom attempt to illustrate this. So you've got an analog signal coming in from the left here. It goes into the analog to digital converter and that converts it into binary numbers, i.e. ones and zeros. And on the right hand side here, you've got a kind of graph. Analog signal input is shown on the bottom. And here we've just got a three bit binary output from the analog digital converter. So the signal levels, the lowest signal level is zero, 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 which is obviously in the noise and the strongest signal is represented by 111. Now to, to avoid distortion, we need to sample fast enough. And the minimum sampling rate is called the Nyquist rate. And it's twice that of the highest input frequency component. So Typically, at the transmitter end, signals are low pass filtered. You take the voice input, for example, that gets low pass filtered to remove all components. Um, uh, well, typically to about three kilohertz if we're sampling, say, at uh, eight kilohertz. So the sampling rate has got to be at least twice that of the highest input frequency component. So at the bottom here, we've got a graph which tries to illustrate this. So we've got a sine wave here. 
Then underneath that, there is a fast clock signal, which is taking lots of samples of the signal. And you can see the samples will give a very accurate representation of the transmitted signal. At the bottom here, you've got the reverse. You've got a clock which is too slow, so that not taking an adequate number of samples. So the result is you get a false representation of the sine wave that we're trying to replicate. Uh, and that's called aliasing. Now, if we look at the bandwidth of a digital signal, we can uh, determine what the signal looks like in the frequency domain by a calculation which is called the Fourier transform, just the mathematical name for it. Effectively, what happens is the signal that you're going to transform is multiplied by a whole series of sine waves. Uh, in the case of a voice signal, it might be represented uh, by sine waves from DC right the way up to uh, 10 or 20 kilohertz, something like that. And that allows you to extract all the different frequency components from the transmitted signal. Uh, I think to note is that at the transmit end, if we sample a voice signal at 8 kilohertz at 8 bits per sample, uh, the resulting bit rate is 8 times 8 or 64 kilobits per second. And this is quite a wide bandwidth signal. So if you look at the right hand bottom of the screen here, you can see a um, photograph of a spectrum analyzer screen. So we've got frequency going from left to right and amplitude up and down here. And you can see it's a wide, very wide band signal. In fact, it op occupies a bandwidth of 64 kilohertz or more. So that's a very wide bandwidth signal. But in fact, we don't need to send all that we can pass it through a filter. In fact, the little blue line here indicates the minimum amount of uh, spectrum that we need to transmit. Half the sampling rate, in other words. Now, just in any other analog system, with a digital system, we can exclude noise from the transmission by filtering the transmitted signal. Now, with digital signals, if you filter the signal, it uh, alters the shape of the transmitted signal in time. Um, now, typically, we use specially shaped filters with a fairly gentle roll off to filter digital signals. Um, the shape of the filter is called raised cosine. Uh, this is the frequency response of a raised cosine filter. From left to right here, we have frequency. And then up and down here, we have amplitude. So you can see it's a fairly gentle roll off. And on the right hand side, here, you can see the impulse. If we were to apply a very sharp pulse to the input of a raised cosine filter, we'd get ringing like this. And with a raised cosine filter, it has the property that the ringing goes through zero at the sampling points. We want to sample our signal at the maximum amplitude, so we don't want adjacent data bits interfering with the data bit that we're trying to uh, decode. Now, the nice thing about um, the current systems like FT8 uh, is that we can do all this processing on a home computer. So with low bit rate transmissions, we can do all our exper um, experimentation uh, at audio frequencies, and we can do all the processing on our home PC. So what we're trying to do uh, with a digital transmission at the receive end of the link is to end up with a nice eye, di eye diagram. So what we're showing here at the top right hand side of the screen is a digital transmission of many random bits which have been overlapped uh, and which have been passed through a raised cosine filter. And you can see a little bit of ripple at the top of the signal here. Uh, but you can see all the ripples cancel out at the optimum sampling point at the maximum point in the eye. So what we're aiming to achieve with our filtering is uh, 
a really nice eye diagram. So this is a, a binary signal here, just applied to the input of a perfect raised cosine filter. Uh, but for experimentation, we can use very simple filters, like a, a moving average filter. So with a moving average filter, many samples of the signal can be taken uh, whilst the signal is being sent, for instance, during the sending of more dots or dashes, and then just average over a large number of adjacent samples. Uh, and you can see this effect down the right hand side here. Here we've got a signal with a certain amount of noise on it. And if you apply a lot of uh, moving average filtering, you can clean up the signal like that. And that's very easy to do on a PC using programming. Now in practice, um, with commercial equipment, filter is filtering is typically split equally between the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, and sometimes pre-distortion of the transmitted signal is used to compensate for non-linearities in the transmit shape or in the shape of the waves, uh, the square waves, the digital square waves which you're uh, transmitting. Now, in order to compress an input signal, um, the amateur uh, voice codecs use special systems. So DMR, D-Star and Fusion all use special coders and decoders to uh, encode the digital voice and then decode it at the far end. And the result is they can greatly reduce the bit rate. If remember, I was telling you early, earlier that um, if a voice signal is sa sampled at 8 kilohertz and there are 8 bits per sample, the resulting bit rate is 64 kilobits per second. Well, with D-Star, for instance, it reduces the bit rate to 3.2 kilobits per second, 3,200 bits per second, so very much reduced bit rate. But if we're experimenting, we can use very simple methods of compression and, for example, Morse code, which uses the shortest codes for the most frequent letters of the alphabet. Um, it's a system which we now call Huffman coding, uh, used for compressing files on disks and so on. So it's a very simple method. Or we can use delta modulation uh, for transmitting voice. And this just sends the changes in signal level in step with the voice input. So if the voice is increasing in, in amplitude, just go down to the next one. If the voice is increasing in amplitude, we just send ones. So the graph at the top here is just showing an analog signal here in blue. And underneath at the bottom, we're showing what a delta modulator would be transmitting. So uh, the signals are rising in amplitude here, so we're transmitting all ones, and the signal is falling in amplitude in here, so we're transmitting all zeros, and we're just transmitting one bit at a time, not eight bit samples. But there are disadvantages with this system. If the analog voice signal changes too quickly, you get what's called slope overload. And if the signal doesn't change at all, you've got some quantization noise. But we can make the step sizes adaptive, and that will overcome that to some extent. It's be quite interesting to experiment with. Uh, another thing to be aware of is that data are typically sent in frames of bits. So you have a block of bits, which is the data you're going to transmit. And typically the frame starts with a special pattern of bits uh, called the frame alignment word four. So that allows the receiver to recognize when the start of the frame is occurring. And at the end of the frame, you also might have an indication of some type, like a cyclic redundancy check, which we'll talk about a bit in a moment. So in the FT8 mode, for example, 77 information bits are sent in the frame of data. Uh, and the end of the data, or within the data, 
are also sent 14 extra CRC bits, according to QEX magazine from the ARRL. Now, CRC just means cyclic redundancy check. Uh, it's a way in which you attach extra bits to the end of the frame of data, and that way you can tell if any errors have occurred in the transmitted frame. Uh, and in the case of FT8, an extra 84 bits are added um, to the uh, total frame which is going to be transmitted, making a total of 174 bits. And these extra bits are used for forward error correction. So a special calculation is done on the transmitted information and that uh, produces a forward error correction, um, 84 bits, which are added to the transmitted data, which allows us to correct data which have occurred on the transmission path. Um, here's some block diagrams of uh, two operations which are often used in digital transmission. Uh, this, this is how the CRC, cyclic redundancy check, is added. And you can see it's a very simple digital circuit, a shift register and a couple of exclusive OR gates. So that could be programmed into a, um, a gate array nowadays, or it could be implemented in software. And if you're interested in finding out about CRCs, there's some very good explanations on the internet explaining how they work. Uh, another thing which is often done with uh, transmitted data is to randomize the data uh, by adding a pseudo-random psych, uh, psych, pseudo sequence uh, it's called scrambling. And that makes sure there are lots of transitions added to the data. So if you were transmitting all zeros, uh, the transmitter would randomize that and produce a random bit pattern. The receiver knows what the random bit pattern is, so it can r remove the effect of the randomization. But it gives you lots of transmissions, which is useful at the receiver, as you'll see in a moment. Another way of combating fading and noise is to either send the signal in fast bursts or spread it over many narrow carriers. For instance, with uh, DBBT, um, instead, instead of sending 20 megabits per second, they have 6,000 carriers, each just carrying a few kilobits per second. And you can also spread the digital signal um, in frequency called spread spectrum. Uh, and the effect of these measures is that um, fading and reflections off buildings or hillsides or mountainsides is, is greatly reduced. If you want to look into forward error correction, which I'll just talk about a bit in a moment, uh, there's a very good article by G4OCR in the January 2019 edition of RADCOM. Uh, another technique which is often used um, is to interleave uh, the, dits which, the bits which you are transmitting. So instead of sending the data in the order in which it's been generated, bit number one, bit number two, bit number three, etc., um, you randomize the data before transmitting it. And the effect of that is that if during transmission you get a burst of errors, we've got three errors shown in red there, at the receive end, the errors are spread out. So that makes it much easier um, to correct the errors at the receive end. Of course, the receiver knows what type of randomization has uh, occurred and it can de-randomize the signal. And the way it's implemented normally is using a memory. So the, the data is read into the memory in the normal way, byte number one, byte number two, byte number three, etc. And then it's read out in bit reversed order. And that has the effect of randomizing the, um, the transmitted, interleaving the transmitted data, I should say. So there are many different types of coding, and I take this from the Magazine article by G4OCR on Hamming codes. 
And a Hamming code is a block code. In other words, it works on blocks of data. And this, in this particular example, it's working on four bits of data that's taken as a block. But there are other types of codes called convolutional codes, which act on streams or frames of data, uh, called Viterbi codes and Turbo codes. Um, the Hamming codes are very simple to implement. So this is a sort of lookup table here. Uh, whatever pattern of four bits you want to transmit, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, right the way down to 1, 1, 1. Instead of transmitting those bits, you transmit the code word shown on the right. Um, so instead of sending 0, 0, 1, 1, we send this 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Uh, and that is calculated using this generator matrix from up here, wherever there's a one, you add one of these rows of bits. Have a look in the magazine article if you're interested. It is very easy to implement. And on the receive side, you can use a, uh, a parity check matrix to decode the data and find out where errors have occurred. This particular code, which sends code words of seven bits long, for every four bits that you want to transmit can correct one error. If two errors occur, it's not able to, to correct them. So that's the digital side. Let's have a look at the modulation now. So this uh, diagram here shows binary phase shift keying. Now you probably know what phase shift keying is. In this particular case, it's binary phase shifting, so zeros are sent as a low frequency here, and ones are sent at a higher frequency. But we can compress the output signal by transmitting symbols, which combine several binary bits into one symbol. So in the case of FSK, instead of just using two frequencies, FT8, for example, uses eight different frequencies and eight and each frequency or tone that's transmitted represents three binary bits so one tone represents zero 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 another tone represents zero zero one and another tone represents zero one zero and so on and so on so you have to transmit less tones and that has the effect of compressing the bandwidth of the signal. Um, a different type of modulation, which can also be used for uh, trans for compressing um, the bandwidth of the signal, is phase shift keying. Now, at the top here, we've got an example of binary phase shift keying. So this is the data that we want to transmit at the top here, 10011. And underneath, you've got the, um, this is the representation of the carrier, which is going to be transmitted. So we've got a transmitted one is showing the sine wave here. And as we go to zero, you can see there's an abrupt change in the phase of the signal. The frequency is the same, but the phase is completely different, 180 degrees change. And this is called the signal constellation at the right hand side. So with binary phase shift keying, we've got two different phases, zero degrees and 180 degrees. So that's 180 degree phase shift there. But if you use QPSK example, for example, um, it uses four different phases. So each phase can re represent two bits for each phase of the transmitted signal. And the bottom here, we've got an example of a four QPSK signal with the four different phases. Here we've got 45 degrees, 135 degrees, 225 degrees, 315 degrees. And this is the signal constellation. So 0, 0 is represented by a 45 degree phase of the carrier, 0, 1 by 135 degrees, 1, 0 by 225 degrees, and so on. 
So a phase, uh, adjacent phase states are represented by just one change in bit level. Uh, one thing we need to do at the transmitter is lock to the exact frequency of the transmitted signal. Uh, you can see that's necessary with a phase shift keying signal. So the one, one thing we can do is lock on to some known feature of the transmitted signal, such, such as the transmitted phase at particular points in time, and lock on to that. Uh, some transmission sy systems um, send preambles, like Hyperlan and 802.11. One of the 802.11 systems used is a preamble, so they transmit a particular sequence of bits, which you know what they are. Uh, and this is the costless loop method. Um, what it does is the incoming signal comes in from the left here, and it removes the modulation from the signal. So at this point here, we've got um, the signal with the modulation removed, in other words, the original carrier of the signal. And we can feed that to a control loop to control, say, a voltage controlled oscillator or a crystal oscillator. So that can give us very accurate frequency lock onto the signal. And also we need to be able to recover the timing um, at the receiver. For instance, supposing we were transmitting a series of bits like this, 10000011. Zero, 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 one, one. Uh, in order to know how many zeros are being transmitted at this portion of time, we need to have an accurately locked clock signal which samples the data at exactly the right point in time. Sometimes we partly know the timing of the signal. Um, for instance, with FT8, it has to start on uh, at sent in 15 second intervals, but uh, you'll still need accurate clock recovery, as it's called, in order to, to, to sample the transmitted signal in exactly the right time and get accurate data decoding. Um, this is a, a way that you could do that. So if we pass a binary signal or random bits into a really nice raised cosine filter, we get an eye diagram like that. Uh, and we'd like to sample the signal at the maximum point in the eye here, the best point where the signal's at its strongest and uh, the noise is uh, minimal. So we could measure the received signal at several points in time, and we can feed that to some sort of processor control loop uh, which can control the clock signal, which you're going to use to demodulate the data. Um, so it, that, that can be done in software, hardware, or hybrid systems using both hardware and software to process the signal. Uh, so that's most of the talking about the signal processing side. So the second part of the talk will be about uh, practical implementations. But just before we go on to that, I'll just show you a block diagram of a commercial system. This is the old DVB-T system, showing all the uh, tricks of the trade that they've employed in order to make the signal as robust as possible um, to channel noise, reflections, fading, and all that sort of thing. So the signal comes in from the left. It's being compressed. We've got compressed video and audio coming in here. Um, it goes into an outer coder, a Reed Solomon coder, a block coder. Then it goes into an interleaver, which spreads the, the data around. It then goes to a Viterbi inner encoder, convolutional encoder, so called. And the output of the Viterbi decoder also gets interleaved. And then some pilot signals, special signals, carriers are added to the uh, transmitted signal as it's modulated with OFDM. So that's orthogonal frequency division multiplex, about 6,800 carriers, uh, which carries several TV signals. And then finally, a guard interval is added to the end of each symbol, so the receiver can recognize when each uh, symbol has been transmitted. And the receiver, of course, does all the uh, reverse of all that. 
All right, let's have a look at some practical implementations. Well, nowadays we can use very low cost hardware uh, to, pro to process digital signals. And I'll show you how I've done this in a moment. Uh, one obvious type is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, from a practical point of view, you probably need to use a USB sound card. I don't think the Raspberry Pi um, audio input is really capable of dealing with it as, as the current system. So you can get one of the sound, sound cards. I think G4JNT had some articles on this. And this external sound card will plug into the USB inputs of a Raspberry Pi here. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3, you need a Raspberry Pi 3 or better for adequate uh, processing power. Uh, I think they cost about £37, something like that nowadays. And now another lower cost version is the Arduino. Um, these can be fitted with add-on boards which plug in on the top, they call them shields. And uh, the add-on boards will allow you to record sound in MP3 format. Uh, it could allow you to generate clock and uh, signals using a number that you could control oscillator or generate frequencies. You can actually generate uh, WSPR signals with an Arduino and they can be very low cost indeed. £1.50 to £3 for the Arduino Nano version. Uh, this is an Arduino Uno, which costs about £11 nowadays. So a relatively low cost hardware. So this is a bit about the Raspberry Pi. Um, the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 are powerful enough to run the WSJTX program. That, that'll uh, uh, transmit and receive um, FT4, FT8 transmitting modes. Uh, you can also use your own code. You can generate your own code at audio, your own signal, and use the Raspberry Pi to transmit and receive it using the sound card. If you want to look at different uh, types of signals that you can use, which are ready programmed, look on the GNU um, radio.org website. It includes a whole lot of different programs which you can easily download. Um, advantage of using the Raspberry Pi is it could be controlled directly or you can control it over the internet using Wi-Fi, either within your own home or computer, or you can plug it into your router at home using the internet cable. And you can then control it um, using software such as SSH or PuTTY, uh, names of programs which run on um, Windows. Uh, SSH runs on Linux. And they will allow you to control the Raspberry Pi as though you're sitting uh, at the Raspberry Pi with a, um, a keyboard and mouse and so on. And you can use vnc.exe and that will give you a remote view of the Raspberry Pi screen on your home PC. So it's just like sitting at the Raspberry Pi uh, with its uh, keyboard and mouse plugged in and you've got the real screen and you can run FT8 from that. Um, very useful programs to know about. If you want to copy files from your home PC and Raspberry Pi, in other words, you've been doing experimentation on the home PC and you want to copy the files to a Raspberry Pi, you can use wcp.exe in Windows or FileZilla in Linux, and they'll allow you just to graphically copy the programs backwards and forwards. A thing to bear aware of with the Raspberry Pi is it has these input output pins, which are very useful. No other computer has those nowadays. Um, but the logic levels are 3.3 volts, they're not the normal 5 volt logic levels such as the Arduino uses. So you have to be careful when you're interfacing to a PC or other electronics. Now this uh, shows you another trick which you can use. Um, you can see your own signals. 
And you can do that by logging in on the internet to online software defined radios, software receivers effectively. So this, this particular one is uh, the Farnham Online SDR, uh, but there are international ones. There's a hat green SDR for HF, so you can do experiments over VHF or HF, and you can see the results of your transmissions. And what I've done here is to record the CW Morse part of the transmission of the GB3 VHF beacon and you can record that, or I, I record it actually on my home computer using a program called Audacity, so on a PC, or you could record it on the Raspberry Pi. And the nice thing about seeing the signal, you can see the signal to noise ratio. Here we've got the noise where the nothing's being transmitted, and the, here you've got a dash and a dot, and you can see the noise on the top of the signal. And if you look on here, you can see the signals for GB3 VHF. So there's G, da da did, and B, da did did, it, etc., etc., of the GB3 VHF. So once you've recorded the signal, and it's a good idea to record it in WAV format, either dot WAV format, you can experiment with the signal offline, and you can try different digital filters, for example, to find out which works best or invent your own filters. Um, and you can process the signals using simple languages like BASIC, Octave, which I'll talk about in a moment, or MATLAB, which is almost identical, or Python. They're very easy to program in. And there are lots of users on the internet, so if you get stuck, you can easily answer, ask questions. Uh, now, this is uh, a simple example of Arduino experimental system. So this setup uses an Arduino Uno program to send more CW. Um, and it's controlled over Wi-Fi uh, using a Raspberry Pi output. Uh, the output's connected to the Arduino input. And when it gets, the Arduino gets the signal from the Raspberry Pi, it starts transmitting the CW signal. Um, now, I can tune into the CW signal using an online SDR like the Farnham SDR. And here I've tuned into it on two meters. And you can probably just see the signal. This is the um, picture. Probably doesn't come out very well on the, um, on, the, on the screens over the internet, but that's what the user interface looks like. It's very easy to use. You get measured signal noise ratios and you can actually see your own signal. Um, now the interface between the Arduino and the transmitter here, which is the Yezu FD897, is just a very simple transistor interface. So when uh, a logical one, four and a half, five volts comes to the input of the transistor, the transistor turns on and the output of the transistor is connected to the Morse key input on the back of the FT897, so it causes dots and dashes to be sent. Uh, this just shows the different modules. So here's the FT897 transceiver, and here's the Raspberry Pi B3, here's the Arduino Uno, here are the plug-in boards, which I've used for interfacing between the Arduino and the transmitter. And here's an interface dongle. You can see how simple the interface is, just plug in boards with wires plugged between them. And here are the listings of the programs. Here again, you may not be able to read them easily, but we may be able to put these uh, listings on the internet so you can download them if you uh, find them of interest. This is using Python, so at Raspberry Pi programmed in Python. And we've got a print statement here at the top and saying, program to send Morse code, press a T to transmit and press control T to exit. Now one thing to watch out for with the Raspberry Pi is it has several different methods of numbering its pins. The pins are called GPIO, general purpose input output, but various different uh, methods are used for numbering them. So look very carefully on the numbering method to be used. 
what the transmitter does is it just waits for an input and waits for me to type a T on the keyboard. Um, if it sees a T, it tells the Arduino to transmit the message and then it sends the message again. Send and press T for transmit or pre press control C if you want to exit the program. Well, this is what the Arduino program looks like. Once again, they're very easy to program. It sends the CW message. Uh, and after sending the CW message, it sends a few seconds of carrier. So you can measure the signal noise ratio for experimentation. So here we've got a number of functions here. It's a C type language. And like the Raspberry Pi Python language, the Arduino uh, graphical user race, interface and programming language, there are a huge number of people using the, this program and user interface. So if you get stuck at all, you can easily go and ask questions on the internet. So I've got functions for sending dots and dashes and uh, a function for sending a CW tone. And I've got functions for sending different letters. So to send T, I send a dash and then a space. Send E, I send a dot and a space. I send G, I send a dash, dash, and a dot, and so on. And so it goes on. Actually, it says S, so dot, dot, dot. Very simple to program. Now, this shows you the results of the program. So the top left hand side here um, is the recorded signal off the farm SDR. So I loaded the recorded signal, which I'd recorded in uh, Audacity, uh, loaded it in, recorded in WAV format, loaded it into Octave, and you can see what a noisy signal it is. Um, on the right hand side here, this is the signal process. We process the signal just using a very simple moving average filter. See how it's drastically reduced the noise. Still quite a lot of noise. We're sending Morse D E here. So the di did it did. And then to improve, to get rid of the more noise, we've got a, an improved longer moving average filter. And here again is the Farnham SDR, if you can see it on the internet. And this is the Octave listing. So Octave is very easy to program. It's free to download uh, and it runs on both Windows and Linux. Very similar to BASIC if you've ever programmed in BASIC. And it's got lots of easy to use built in functions. So it's got a function to read WAV files. At the top here you'll see um, the file name, read the file in, plot the file here just a command plot and you get nice graph as I was showing you on the previous slides. And then we process the signal by filtering and so on. Once again, if you get stuck, there's a whole Octave and MATLAB community and you can look on their website and you can see how to process the signal. Now this is using FD8 transmission. So we've got the transceiver here. Uh, um, got the Raspberry Pi. We're not using Arduino in this case, so I'm not using it. Um, but the Arduino, uh, you could use it if you wanted to, controlled by the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the transmission and receive signal is sent by this audio dongle, which is connected to the back of the FT8. So you just need the audio interface, and you uh, have to set the FT8. Sorry, you have to set the Yezu FT897 transceiver to digital mode in order to, to do that. The other transceivers will have a, a separate system, so we're not using the microphone input. Now, the nice thing about uh, digital transmission is that you can see the results of what's happened. So you can log into this site called PSK Reporter. So this was transmitting about uh, 10 watts on two meters, FT8. And you can actually see how far you're getting out. So it's just using a, um, a rather poor aerial on the balcony here in uh, North London. And you can get out to Wales and right out to north of France there. So you can actually see what's going on. And you can set this program to give you measured signal to noise ratios so you can get real measurements by logging into a PSK Reporter. So that's that's it all.
Um, just a few things you might like to look into. You can look into GPS and spread spectrum microwaves, which have got their own problems. Uh, you can look at the novel new modes coming in are about, like FT8 and the Q65. You can invent your own forward error correction systems. Uh, feedback and artificial intelligence is a very hot topic. Or look at the commercial systems. The commercial people are uh, looking at MIMO at the moment. That's multiple aerial system. Uh, and that can be very effective, of course, as we know only too well. And you can look at the Octave website, www.gnuradio.org. Uh, GNU Radio is a free and open source software development toolkit. And you've got blocks here. Once again, you'll probably find these are rather blurred looking at it over on the internet. But here we've got a FunCube dongle block. So you can model a signal coming out of a FunCube dongle. Pass it into a low pass filter here. It's a low pass filter block. They're already programmed for you. Then you've got a squelch block here. If the quality of the signal is not good enough, you can switch it off. And then you've got an NBN, NBFM receiver block. And finally, you've got an output block. You can listen to the audio, and that's already programmed. And of course, you can do your own work uh, using the ideas from gnuradio.org. So that's the end of it from the presentation side. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Um, the emphasis I wanted to give was that uh, with modern hardware and software, it's not difficult at all. And you really could come up with some interesting ideas. So if you have any questions, thank you for listening. Well, I used to love Morse code in the old days. I had to pass the Morse test, of course, many years ago. In fact, I took it at the Royal Liver Building in Liverpool, funnily enough. Uh, not particularly brilliant at it in those days, obviously, just 12 words a minute. Uh, but it's quite fun to do. I found it very interesting to, to play with, particularly as uh, computers started to come out. And uh, tried experimenting with it. And... Uh, one of my first jobs was with uh, BBC Outside Broadcasts where, uh, on microwave radio links. I was working on some of the um, the digital uh, ideas which were just coming out in those days. Um, we were using a special uh, modulation technique, um, which was constant amplitude, rather like GMSK that's used nowadays on the mobile phone network. And so... It, it was a digital system and you could pass it into um, classy amplifiers and uh, it didn't distort the signal. I found that, that very interesting and you could program everything in, of course, it was TTL logic in those days. Of course, nowadays everything's moved over to program or gate arrays. But you could program your filters and program a filter into a ROM and then when you want to filter the signal, you just read the output relevant outputs from the from the ROM. So I don't know if that all is, <laughs> is a good enough answer for you. Uh, <laughs> right. Hello. Right, Just that works. Sorry, no, it's okay. Uh, there's so many options here, it's uh, a little bit confusing with the audio side of things. Um, I haven't seen the other quit any other um, uh, any other, uh, sorry, um, questions come in. Uh, so uh, I think we'll leave it there. I'm just going to give a quick update on what we have come in, uh, coming up again. Thanks, Rob, for uh, this evening. That's uh, it's been interesting. It's been uh, it's good to see about the digital radio, and uh, uh, it's been uh, an interesting experience for us trying to get this on. So thank you for uh, 
helping us out by um by being our sort of guinea pig for this right thanks for your help thank you um i let me just take you through what we've got coming uh, in the near future. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, on the 12th of February, we have Resilience and Preparedness Awareness, uh, which is taught by uh, Daryl. Um, he, um, he gave his talk a few weeks ago, and uh, we shall... Um, uh, sorry, um, uh, that will be going out in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, on the 26th of February, we have a special general meeting uh, regarding rules. Uh, on the 12th of March, we hope to have another talk, which we haven't um, yet uh, uh, confirmed. And on the 26th of March, our annual general meeting. Obviously, we hope to be able to give you uh, some more things in the future. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. And uh, just to answer one question I've quickly seen in the talk, we will try and get some of Rob's code up um for you to be able to use uh, should you wish to do so so thanks again very much to rob um thanks to all of you for watching and uh, we will uh, see you again uh, in the near future